to be able to work now for 10 years as a coach and for the last five years as a full-time coach. Uh, it has been a long way. We have worked very hard. And now I work with eight athletes from four different countries, and they're all full-time athletes uh, on a different level. But I hope I'm going to have six or seven at the Olympics, and four or five of them have a decent chance to be in the final, and at least two can make medals. Uh, I'm very happy to be in England, because Ron Pickering is one of my best friends. And I thank you, Ron. Uh, no, uh, Sean, for, sorry. Sean for uh, bringing us here because uh, it has always been my dream to be able to come to a big country like this and do a lecture or coach some athletes from England. It would be fun. But uh, enough of that. We, we go on with the big guy with the big hands. <laughs> Gert, if you want to say a few your words. Hello. I'm also glad to be here. As Western told, we started on year 2000. Now we've been working like seven years. And of course, start was very difficult. I was very ambitious. I wanted to throw far, very fast. Didn't really succeed. It. But like last <coughs> three years, I've been succeeding, making medals. First medal in 2005 in World Championships, but <coughs> silver. And also silver last year from European Championships. And finally, gold medal this year from Osaka. But I really have to say thank you for this man here because he's been coaching me and like giving me all his tips. So if I wouldn't maybe find him, I wouldn't be where, where I'm now. So and now we'd like to share this knowledge that we have to you. Thank you. You can just have a seat. I'm gonna show you. Uh, uh, one uh, slide here that makes me very happy because after seven years <coughs> we actually reached this. Bro, this is Gerd Cantor of Estonia, the 28 year old. He's been chasing a legend for years, European silver medalist. And he likes that one. Look at how much he exceeds. The leading mark out to 226 feet, 2 inches for a That was, after seven, seven years of hard work, we got there. And uh, it made me get some tears in my eyes. <laughs> and uh, the president in Estonia invited us uh, uh, to a big celebration. And uh, he said, that he wanted the guy with the tears in his eyes. And that was <laughs> that was me, and uh, and uh, that was a big honor. You got a handout uh, over there that I'm gonna go through here on this lecture. In the middle of the lecture, we're gonna have a little break for two or three minutes, and. Uh, And what we are going to do here is going to go through, in general, what we do, wh how, how we train, in general. Sean, this is not working. I just go out. OK. OK. We're going to go through it. And in the handout, the meaning of the handout is that you have something to go home with and read at home. I tried to put it together in, a, in text that everybody can read, that is simple. But there's a lot of information uh, here that I put a little bit in a in a different uh, format here. What we do is that during the year, we have periods of eight periods. We go on uh, training camps or training camp periods. You have six. We have one macro cycle, or we have an outdoor season. 
We have 14 meso cycles that are short <coughs> or like different cycles. We train like in different uh, system. That, like we, we train sometimes weekly program. We train sometimes three, one plan that we train three days and, and rest one day, three day, one, one day rest. We usually do that during training camps. And then when we are at home, we train weekly plan. Because I work with eight athletes and I plan it like that, that I try to live my life as a throwing coach, an international throwing coach, and I live in Helsingborg, Sweden. My athletes live in Tallinn, Estonia, Copenhagen and Aarhus, Denmark, Utah in America, and Cairo in Egypt. So I was wondering, how am I going to make a career being in Sweden? So I plan it like that, that my athletes come to me six times a year for 14 days on training camps, and then we train the training camp plan. Uh, I have assistant coaches on all the countries, and then I work with a lot of specialists in different areas, biomechanics, uh, physios, massage people, and stuff like that, psychologists. And and I plan it like that, that they come to me 14 days, six times a year, and then we go on training camps to South Africa, San Diego, and before the big championships in the summer, for usually 10 to, or 21 days in South Africa, 21 days in San Diego in the spring. In January, we go to South Africa. And now, before China, we go to uh, Marugame in Japan for 14 to 20 days. We have a single periodization, and we, we plan, I plan it like that on the year basis, like you see on the first page of this handout, that uh, we have those meso cycles here, general preparation, hypertrophy, camp period one and camp period two. Uh, and uh, <coughs> like if you look at here, general preparation, 28 days, hypertrophy, or camp in Helsingborg for, for eight weeks here. Uh, it's part of this period. Camp in South Africa, 28 days. We have a maintenance period when you come home for 28 days. We have strength uh, and camp period in San Diego for 42 days total. Maintenance period two. And then we have competition one, two, three, and four uh, during the summer. You have all this stuff in front of you and if you go on the first general preparation period that you also have there, <coughs> then it is actually very important. Don't forget, this period is done in October. And uh, I have only once not been able to do this period with Gert. And that was this year because he was a world champion. He was very busy. And we didn't have the time as we usually do to do this period because this period is done in October. Like you see here, it's a weekly plan and it's general stuff. It's like running, long distance running. It's, uh, it's like, like you see here, a uh, weekly plan. We train Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, rest Sunday. Uh, we throw twice a week. In a net, we lift twice a week, we do fitness twice a week, and, and the, it's like a kind of, kind of general stuff. We didn't have time to do this as we usually do this year. What happened in the first week? He hurt himself. So, if I have a message to you, when you start to train in October, usually we have like a little layoff in September in track and field or athletics. After you are done with the season, have a couple of weeks, up to four weeks of rest. Train three times a week during that rest period. Go and play tennis or whatever. But after you start, the first four weeks, do general preparation. Okay? And what is general preparation? It is uh, first. Uh, mesocycle, uh, microcycle is four weeks, lifting sessions only two, and it's circle training and very general stuff. 
circle training, three times, 10 to 15 reps, very old fashioned way of doing things. Run long distance, uh, 30 to 45 minutes twice a week, and we throw stand, step on turn, South African on full turns, just to get going, okay? This is very important. <clears throat> As you can see here, the basic stuff is throwing twice a week, 40 to 50 throws, 80 to 90 percent, lifting circle training three times, 10 to 15, with one minute rest in between, long distance running, continuous running once a week with 75 percent pulse, in interval running, and I actually got a phone call from Erki Nul once, you know Erki Nul, world champion in, uh, in decathlon, and he said, Gert is just running like hell. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I, and he said, I really like that. Like a 125 kilo guy running interval training. And what is that with you? Why are you letting him do that? And I said, it has nothing to do with discus. But if he does 10 times 200 with two minutes in between, it's going to be very easy for him to run five times 50 later or five times 20 meters later. It's psychology. I did this some years ago, and it was actually pretty funny when we started to do this. I even went up to 300 meters. And a guest called me and asked, why am I running so much? And I said, don't worry about it, just do it. <laughs> and, and he did. But then when I took it away, a couple of periods later, he called me and said, why am I not running more? <laughs> So we actually do this, stretch, uh, we do a special way of, of stretching uh, during this uh, period as well as other periods. If we take the next period, because this, you can read this when you come home, all the information is, is on this sheet and it's general preparation period done in October for four weeks, no Olympic lifting, no power lifting, long distance running twice a week, fitness twice a week with all kinds of gymnastics and uh, uh, medicine ball and stuff like that, and then throwing twice a week and circle training twice a week. Only one session a day. If you go to the next period, that is called in your handout hypertrophy, There you have all the information, and then we have, it's a mesocycle two and three, it's done in November and December. We are right there now. We have one more week of this period. You go through eight one-week cycles. And as you can see, we train on Monday twice. It's a weekly plan. Two, two, one. It's like two on Monday, two on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, two on Thursday, two on on Friday, one on Saturday, and rest. This is a typical setup, how we do, 10 <coughs> sessions a week. We throw, for the most part now, four times, but we have been up to six times a week. Lifting is done four times a week, on day one and two, and on day two, uh, four and five. Fitness is twice a week on those days here. You can see that on the paper. Uh, tempo and rest is getting faster and there's longer rest in between what we do and this is like volume. It's up to three hours sessions, very often two and a half hours in the weight room. Old fashioned way of doing things, okay? But we still do it because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But I actually have had, had the privilege to be so old, I'm 47 years old, that I've been able to train with all the legends within discus. I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them. Wolfgang Smith, Mac Wilkins, John Powell. When I was young, they were old. I was in California and I learned a lot from them. And I used to train with those guys. <laughs> and when I talk about old fashion, a lot of this stuff that I do builds on what they did. Then we have used modern like uh, science also. So I follow what's going on in the world but experience and uh, common sense as well as 
us, science is very important. If we take the training methods during this period, that is called hypertrophy, here we get big and strong during this period, but not very fast. It's in November, December, and it takes like eight weeks. There's a lot of repetition. We throw uh, 40 to 60 throws in a net. We throw mostly with uh, a yellow ball that is like a three kilo, like a, what do you call it, power ball? Like a three kilo power ball. And we throw with a 10 feet tool that is two and a half kilo. And also discus at the end of this period. Uh, uh, I'm going to go through another session of the lifting, but when it comes to this, I'm just going to go through it very shortly here. Olympic lifts are done, and you maybe see there that it's 120 to 130 percent. We never do any cleans or snatches during November or October, November, December. We only do pulls, snatch pulls, clean pulls on 120 to 130 percent of what you can clean and snatch. Okay? Power lifts are done within, oh, I'm sorry, within this region here, between four and ten repetitions. When we talk about the lifting part in the afternoon, I go more in detail about that. <coughs> then what I call small exercises is like all auxiliary exercises that are not uh, related to Olympic lifting and power lifting, specific exercises for discus and specific <coughs> exercises for symmetry. We still do long distance running here with a little less time, 20 to 30 minutes on, on a 75% pulse, and we still do stretching. Uh, during this period, you can see everything we do on this sheet of paper, and it is uh, pretty much information on one sheet of paper, but you get it all there depending on uh, uh, like like what you want to see. Uh, when it comes to uh, this period, the main goal is after the period in October. The main goal here is to keep healthy, get bigger, and get like basically stronger in the weight room during this period in repetitions. Okay? During this period, we throw uh, 40 to 60 throws a day in net. We live in cold countries, so we are not throwing outside. <coughs> we are throwing in the net. And most of the throwing uh, part is done with full throwing. In October, November, December, we do some standing throws. And we do some uh, step and turns and... Uh, and uh, South Africans, but not really anymore. You have to understand that Gerd Kanter is a world champion now. When I started with him uh, seven years ago, he was a young man with big hands uh, that was looking for something. During the first three years, we did a lot of drills, a lot of different things. I'm going to go through that with you on the <coughs> sessions tomorrow, and you're going to start, you're going to do that. The athletes that are here are going to do that with us. That is the first part of what we did in 2000 to 2004. Now, 90% of all Gert Cantor's throws are full turn throws. Full turn throws with reverse or without reverse. Okay? 90% of all the throws, even in this period. We just got done with a camp in Helsingborg where uh, we threw between uh, 40 and 50 throws a day. We did some standing throws, but most of them were non-reverse and reverse throws with full spin. That is the key. Why is that the key? Because it is the key when you have gotten so good technique that Gerd Cantor has, he's not learning the basics anymore. I'm working on three details for 2008 with him on the technical part. <coughs> the only way to get that together is to do as many repetitions as possible. Get Cantor is not going to get faster in the circle by doing sprints. Now. He did when he was younger. General speed work is done a lot 
in the circle, even in this period, that is a hypertrophy period where you're getting big and strong, the key is that during this period where he's doing 10 repetitions in the squats, we are throwing in the circle with pretty good speed. That is one of the keys to the success of Gert Cantor. We never go <coughs> that far away from the throwing part. We don't kill ourselves in the weight room in this period, even though it's a period we are supposed to get big and strong. So we go too far away from the throwing part. It's a very important part, okay? If we take the next period, that is the camp period. That is fun because we go, we, we had just done with our first camp and that was uh, in Helsingborg now for 14 days. We are going on our second camp on 8th of January to South Africa. <coughs> Most of the time when we are on camps, I have this system. You have it in detail here. Read it when you come home, compare it to hypertrophy period, compare it to general preparation and see the difference. During this period, we go from weekly program where, because Gert, when Gert is in Tallinn, he trains on a weekly program. It's very convenient for everything. You can have a life uh, <laughs> away from, you know, discus. But we don't have a life when we are in camps. Then we live on a hotel, we train, we sleep, and we eat. We don't really do anything else. So that means that we train 3-1 system. <coughs> what is a 3-1 system? We train two times the first day, two times the second day, two times the third day, and then we rest. That means this can be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then this comes again on Friday. So it's not like a weekly program. This is very effective. So we never train more than six sessions and then we rest. Throwing is three to four times per round. So that means we are throwing every day and a lot of times twice on this day here. We call that performance day. Because on camps, when we go to South Africa, we throw far already in January. For the last couple of years, Gert has thrown 70 meters in January. And people say, why? And I say, why not? <laughs> uh, because he is a disco store. It's just like a piano player plays the piano eight hours a day. Gymnastic people do gymnastics eight hours a day. We throw discos all day. And what, why? Because you get good at what you do. Learn by doing. So we throw discus and we throw it far all year around. That doesn't mean that we are peaking in January. Absolutely not. Because we are training very hard during this period. And as you see, it's strength camp period. During this period here, as you can see on the next slide here where you take, take the training method, methods, we even go up in the Olympic lifts. Ah, 200%. Usually not in, in this, <coughs> this camp too much, much more in San Diego in the spring. But the throwing part, as you can see, comparing to hypertrophy period, is down. We are now outside. We are throwing 20 to 40 throws every day. <coughs> On day one, we throw in the morning 20 throws. We go in the afternoon and we throw 6 to 10 throws all out and we throw far and it's fun it's really fun in January 30 degrees and why do we do it on second session because my experience with, all, with throwing my experience with uh, working with scientists from Denmark Estonia and different countries and I have actually very good contact in Germany as well is the performance day after rest 
is the second session. I go more into that later. Second session after rest is where we throw far. Second session after rest, after 72 hours away from the weight room. Second session after rest, after 72 hours in the weight room. Power lifts here are, as you can see, down to one to five reps, three to five sets. Small exercises, less reps, and we go into one set max here in, in, the, in, the, in that. And even here, on the last day, we do long distance running on treadmill. For, for that is the last session before we go into the rest on uh, this day here, okay? At the end of the, this day here, we jog for 20 to 30 minutes before we go into the rest day. All this information is on this sheet here. And as you can see, it's a mesocycle, multiple, because we have go on many camps. We go actually on nine camps a year, six in Helsingborg, one in, in South Africa, one in San Diego, and one in, um, in before the big championships. Uh, microcycles are many because they are three to six days, and it's always this same system. Uh, throwing is, is a lot of throwing here, but, but as you could see on this sheet here, the throwing part is down to 20 to 40 throws a day. Uh, lifting part is that we lift every day on this here, uh, and I split it up from, uh, as you can see here on day they, uh, when we do uh, each exercise is set here, lifting days, sessions on day two, we do clean and bends, and we do push press and squats on day three. So this is all like mixed up like that. We can discuss this together later if you want to go more in detail on it. And during the weekend here, we're going to meet six times. So there's a lot of time to discuss this. But this program has been like a winning program. So I've asked the guest through the years if we should change this. And he said, no, I don't want to change this. The only thing that we have changed since we started doing this, because we have done a lot of camps, extremely many camps, is that he got some back problems uh, one and a half year ago. And I decided to go from a 4-1 plan to 3-1 plan because of that. That's the only difference, but the system is the same. 3-1 system instead of 4-1 system. Throw twice on the first day, and then throw in the morning on the second day, throw in the morning on the third day. In the afternoon on second and third day, we lift, and it's always the same setup. First thing, cleans and clean pulls with bench press. On the sec third day, always push press with squats alternated front squats and back squats. I'm going to go in detail into that in the lifting part of the, what, we, what we are going to do in the afternoon here. We were here. And then we go into the next one. And that's one of the keys to the success, I have to say, if, it, if I take like, why has it been going well? It's because I had a guy from Iceland that I coached before Gert. I killed that guy. <laughs> Not in that way that I shoot him. <laughs> I'm going to answer your question later. Uh, I used to train very much myself in the 80s, a lot of volume. And if you coaches want to realize something, don't coach people like you trained yourself. Because you are specific. Every individual is specific. What I've learned, and I've been very successful with this, probably because I'm working with people from different countries. Now I have extremely good people. I have Gert, I have Omar El Ghazari, I have Christina Sjavin in Javelin from Denmark. And, and I've had the privilege to work with Joachim Olsen from Denmark that has eight medals in the big championships. I've learned 
that people come from different schools, <coughs> they are different talents, mentally, physically, technically, and I've actually noticed that I big, did a big mistake with the Icelandic guy. He did pretty well until he hurt himself. But because of I had the Icelandic guy and I tried to let him train like I used to do, I didn't succeed the whole way with him. Gert was the second guy I coached and I've succeeded or we have succeeded together with all the people that work with us. So he is the best guy now with Alekna, but at least he won Alekna in the world championships. What is the success story? It is that I've taken Try, try to look at him and see how he works, like physically, mentally, technically and stuff. And try to take my experience with science and with the common sense of trying to put together a system that works for this guy and only for him. There is nobody else that is doing the same thing. I'm generalizing here a little bit about how I work in general. This is not only what we are doing with Gert that I'm talking about here, but in general, the idea is work individually with every individual, make their own system, system for every individual. I have four very, very, very good athletes. They have all different systems. So don't make that mistake to draw the same thing over everybody and that they're going to do the same thing that you used to do. Use some of it, but not all of it, okay? If we take the maintenance period, I said this is one of the reasons for why we are successful. When we come home from South Africa, or when Gert goes home from the camp that he has been on now, usually we have it like that, that then he goes into a maintenance period. Now you can see if you compare to this training method and comparing to this training method, this is much less intensity. So after we throw 70 meters in South Africa in <coughs> January, that is half psychological, we go home and throw, and there's snow outside, and he starts to throw in the net again. Boring as hell, but very important because when we go home, we keep on the weekly program here. Ah. Two, two, one, two, two, one. Back to basics, like we used to do in hypertrophy period in, in November, December. Back to the same system, but different volume and intensity in the lifting. And we are throwing uh, four to six times a week. We keep <coughs> on throwing a lot in the net with full turns, with reverse, no, with non-reverse. We go into lifting again four times a week. We do fitness twice a week on those days, um, Wednesdays and Saturdays as usually. We go into a little bit slower moves and we go back to long sessions. And how long do we do this? Eight times one week, that is eight weeks. Mesocycle cycle five to eight in February and March and in May and until June sometimes, but usually that period is shorter because we are going a little bit later to San Diego than we used to. <coughs> this is very important. So what do we do in South Africa? We go and we go up in intensity in the weight room and we go up in intensity in throwing. We come home and we work between six and eight, eight weeks and do a maintenance program where there is nothing to do except just work, just work and work and work and work with lower intensity in the weight room and lower intensity throwing. That means that here is supposed to be 60. We throw 40 to 60 throws again, so the volume of throwing goes up, the intensity goes down, the Olympic lifts uh, intensity goes down and the volume goes up. Power lifts is done in the very old-fashioned way, 5 by 5, 75 to 85 percent. Remember, we were up to 100 percent here before. <coughs> Small exercises, we get l much more volume. And we go and we keep on doing the long-distance running uh, on the fitness days, on Wednesdays and Saturdays. This 
period is very important. You have that period here in the maintenance program and with all the details and you can see here that it's mesocycle 5 to 8, it's microcycle 8 microcycles, it's lifting day sessions like we said here and then all the exercises are here and all the training methods are here. And if we go and look at when we are doing this, comparing to <coughs> this period. Here we train for three to four weeks. Usually we go to three to four weeks on the training camps. Then the intensity is very high. At the end of this period, they are dead. They've been throwing very ha hard. They've been throwing outside, come out of Tallinn, where it's snow in January, to South Africa. We throw very hard and we lift, as you can see, up to 100%, very few reps. Here we go up and do maybe max threes in the, in the <coughs> cleans or, or bends or squats or whatever, a lot of threes, <coughs> and then we come home and we work here fives, okay, on lower percent, much lower percent. This period is just as important to, to be able to not overtrain when we come home. Because a lot of times big throwers want to be as big as possible and strong as possible as soon as possible. That's the old fashioned way of doing it. We actually have a philosophy that for every kilo that my athletes go up, they are supposed to throw farther. For every kilo they go up in the weight room, they are supposed to throw farther. Otherwise, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that the philosophy is that the weightlifting and the throwing part is not separate things. We don't go into the weight room to be stronger to be stronger. We go into the weight room to be stronger to throw farther. That's a very different thing. Gert Cantor is an expert on this. He's really my best athlete when it comes to that. That we sit down in September and I ask Gert, how, how much stronger are you, do you believe you need to be? And you know what the answer was this year? I don't think I need to be stronger. And I said, well, that's a good good thing because I don't think you need to be stronger either. So we agreed on that. Then if we go up 5 or 10 kilos in one event, that's okay, but it's not the main goal. So how is Gert going to throw further then? He's thrown 73 meters. How is he going to throw 75? How is he going to be an Olympic champion or break the world record? What are we going to do? Well, we have to think about it, that the success of throwing the discus has not only to do with being big and strong, has also, also a lot to do with the technical work, and we do a, a, a lot of technical work. And then it's actually not only the physical and technical, it's actually social life and it's actually mental. And if Gert is going to win the Olympic Games, it's going to be because he's going to be stronger mentally. And he has gotten to be much stronger mentally <coughs> for the last few years, and we've been working on that. So notice here that physically, it's very important after a hard period that there comes a pretty long period where we don't get bigger and stronger <coughs> and we get the body to rest and go through volume training again. That is because if we go up, and usually when my athletes come to me, they are very motivated and they are very eager to get stronger and bigger. And, and more explosive and everything. And usually we succeed with that during the camps. So at the end of the camps, they are tired. Then, because of some reason, through the years, I've been smart enough to let them have a period when they come home that is easier so they can recover. That prevents injuries, and that actually makes the big bodies that have gotten stronger during the camps, they get a time to adjust to the technical work that we have been doing, 
and adjust to the lifting work that they have been, have been doing. Because usually the injury comes because of too hard work or too wrong, like wrong training. It's usually the, the reason for you hurt yourself, okay? So if we take through it so far, and if everybody is with me on the sheet of paper, if we take general preparation, that is like four weeks in October, we take hypertrophy, that is the first hard period with a lot of repetition in the weight room, a lot of volume throwing in the net in November, December, and then it's the first camp period here for three to four weeks in January where we raise the intensity up to 95 to 100% of max in the weight room and we throw hard. And then we go on and we come home to the snow again and we have six to eight weeks of maintenance work. And we are here in March, okay? Then we go again on a training camp here to this period. Okay, San Diego, and what do we do in San Diego? In San Diego, it's the only time during the year where we max out in lifting. We don't do it as much in South Africa, even though I, I say during this period here, it's up to 100%, like here. We do it mostly in San Diego. And the theory behind that I have until 11.30, right? The theory behind to, to in May, in middle of May, we do our maxes, and remember this, in the weight room. We throw 70 meters again during that period. So during this period in South Africa and San Diego, it's very similar camps. But the concentration in San Diego in April and May compared to January is that after that period, we never, remember, never, we never go up to 100% in the way to after middle of May. Never. And when do we peak? Late August. So three months before June, July, August. Never more than 92.5% in the weight room. Why? Because it takes the body a very long time. If I would be a power lifting coach or an Olympic weightlifting coach, it would maybe be different. But we are, we are talking about here about an athlete that is 125 to 128 kilos. He gets a little bit stronger during the year. He gets 10,000 throws in during the year, totally, 10 to 12,000 throws a year, according to this. And it's supposed to happen in 0 0.73 seconds, like that. That's what it takes biomechanically for get can to throw the discus, like from one point to another where the biomechanic measures it. So it's not a separate thing, the lifting part and the throwing part. It is very much involved. And during experience, science, common sense, we have noticed that the longer period you have after you max out in one to three repetitions in the big exercises in the weight room, it takes a lot of weeks to get the technical part to sit there so you can go from one meet to another and throw far all the time. And if we can say, what is the trademark of get counter is that he throws pretty far all the time. He throws pretty far all the time. I don't know how many he throws. He throws like this year six times over 70 meters. Sometimes in good conditions and sometimes actually in no wind at all. That means that this guy is in unbelievable shape pretty much from January until the end of the year end of the season. <coughs> you never go too far away from the, the important thing. So if you take the competition period now,
competition period, June to September. A lot of microcycles because we work 3-1, 3-1. How do I do? I take the competition schedule. I happen to be his manager also, so I take, I'm in charge of the meets. Usually in April and May, the meet schedule is put up. I, I put the schedule together so we do 3-1 system. And sometimes if it's very few days in between, in, in between meets, we can't do it. But the general idea is to do the camp system during the summer. So we work 3-1, 3-1, 3-1 during the summer in between meets and maybe sometimes 2-1. And the peaking is always the same. So the process before each meet is always the same. That is periodization because the body and the nervous system uh, learns that after certain physical activity, you get rest. When the body rests, it reacts in a certain way. And that way, I know how this guy works. I didn't know in the beginning, but I happened to get pretty lucky with him, as well as I've done with some of my other athletes. But then I've also done some stupid thing with, with something, some people. But it has worked for Gert. So notice this. We always, if we have a meet on a Saturday, let's say he's going to Madrid to throw. We rest on a Thursday. The last lifting session is on a Wednesday and throwing session. So let's say that this is the last session. Here we throw in the morning and we lift in the evening. Here's a rest. And this is Thursday. This is a Wednesday. This is a Thursday. On a Friday, we do something what we call wake up call or fitness. And what is that? Get goes to Madrid, maybe on that day, on Friday. The competition in Spain is always late in the evening. So let's say that the meet is at 8 o'clock in the evening on a Saturday. On the Friday, if he flies in the morning out, we do 10 throws on a Friday night, 90% of max. 10 throws. That is a, what we call a call a wake-up call or fitness before the meet. This is always done 24 hours within the meet. Okay? 24 hours within the meet. Science says, and all the people that I work with, don't rest more than 48 hours from the technical part of the event. <laughs> Physical part, we rest 72 hours. <coughs> so the 72 hours is the minimum we rest from squats an Olympic lifting, 72 hours before. So we do that on a Wednesday. On a Thursday, we totally rest. The body is a little bit rusty after that. We fly out and we take a wake-up call on Friday night with 10 throws on 90% and we compete 24 hours later, okay? That's the system every single time for the last seven years. And it works. It's pretty funny. Uh, throwing is the same here, like we talked about earlier. So I put this together with the with the system uh, of uh, meets, and fitness is included in everything here. And the sessions are very short, uh, one to one and a half hours, and the uh, and the pairing of the of the exercises is the same as usually on the camp period. So this period is very similar to the camp period. Training methods. Uh, throwing is then 10 to 30 throws. And that means that on day one, we throw sometimes twice, sometimes once, depending on how the meet schedule is. And we throw far then on day one. and. Uh, or sometimes on day two, or always on the second session. If we have like uh, uh, throwing only once a day, we throw on second day. So it's always on the second session after a meet. Olympic lifting here is mostly one to three reps, 
a lot of times three to five sets. And usually within this range here, 82.5 to 92.5% during the whole summer. Power lifts, three to five reps, three to five uh, sets, sets and reps, 80 to 90%. So you see here, comparing to the camp period where we max out a lot of times in San Diego in April or May, and sometimes in South Africa, we are actually working through the whole summer <coughs> sub-maximum. What does that mean? It's called muscle lab training, if you know what it is. We are always working within the range that we are putting speed on the bar and speed on the movements. During the, the summer, we also throw discus most of the time, a little bit Denfi tool that is 2.5 kilo hammer, this long, that has been one of the secrets of Gert Cantor's success. Denfi tool, write it down. Get it, it's very important. We are one of the few people in the world that use it very much. We use it during the whole year, and that is really the part what I call uh, specific strength training part, is the throwing of the Denfi tool once to twice a week all year around, even during the season. Uh, small exercises are very few here during this period, and uh, we are mostly doing cleans, clean pulls, uh, squats, front squats, push presses, and stuff like that that I'm going to talk about in my session later. You have maybe noticed here that if we take like the, what we are doing here, we are doing lifting, we are doing running, we are doing long distance running, and during this period you can see there is no long distance running. But where is the jumping? <coughs> where is the jumping part? Have you seen any jumping? We don't do jumping. Wow. <laughs> Why don't we do jumping? Because I did jumping all my, all, all my career. I did it twice a week, all my career. Then I happened to meet one of the biggest scientists in the world in explosive strength, Dr. Dietmar Schmidt-Bleiser from Germany. I had a meeting with him, and, and then I took that information to the people that I worked with in, in Denmark that are very high-level people also, and they agreed with me. I asked them a question. I have throwers, and I took Gert Cantor and Joachim Olsen as an example. I have throwers, <coughs> and these are their training programs. And... Uh, <coughs> what, do, what do you think? And then they ask me, why are you letting them jump? And I say, because I think plyometric jumping is really good for throwing. And then they ask me, where have you seen that? And I just, uh, well, it just happened to be that I did it my, <laughs> the whole my, of my life, and I think it's really good. And then I say, then they ask me, why don't you just take it out? Because you get everything you need from, uh, from lifting and throwing, and if you just keep them healthy, because you don't have place for it in the program. So I just happened to try it with Gert in 2003 and 2004. And he totally exploded in, in the throwing part, and we didn't have any injuries jumping. I'm not saying it's wrong to do jumping, because plyometric strength is really good. And I do it with some of my athletes, but very little, actually. But there is a difference between youth training and elite training. I did all this stuff with Gert earlier, but what we are doing now, we are spending all our time on throwing and lifting. And then we are spending a lot of time on preparation for warming up before we throw hard and stretching and doing functional flexibility and stabilization in relation to that. So we spend a lot of time getting prepared for the most important thing that is to throw 10 to 12,000 throws a year and gradually get stronger during the years, but not so much that you uh, get too strong to throw far. 
The biggest problem in throwing, as well as the biggest problem in marathon running, is that the marathon runner, they run too much and get stretch fractures. And we lift too much and we forget how to throw. That is really the message that I can give it to you. Get Cantor is actually not very strong in the weight room if you compare it to a lot of our throwers in the past. He has thrown 73, 38 meters. He's thrown six meets this year over 70 meters and he's a world champion. I'm going to tell you in the afternoon how strong he is in the weight room. But he's very fast in the circle. He's very dynamic. And he has actually a pretty good technique that is even, even going to be better in 2008. I hope. <laughs> I got one question here. Uh, if we do 90% of the throws now, don't take me wrong on the jumping part, by the way. There's nothing wrong with jumping, but for the last four years, we have not been using it because we don't have space for it in the program. And the, the experts told me that these guys are too heavy to jump. They're going to kill themselves in the back, knees, and stuff. So I'm putting a lot of time into regulating the volume and intensity in the throwing part in the periods, as you can see, to be able to hold those guys together and throw far, okay? But the question was, if we throw 90% of the throws with full spin, non-reverse and reverse, was it in the 2000, 90% drills? No, it was not. It was maybe 40%. Never get away from what's important. A discus thrower needs to throw 10,000 throws a year. Where did that come from? John Powell. John Powell used to be my coach. So I actually took that from him. Throw 10,000 throws a year. How many throws is that a day? 50 throws a day, five times a week for 10 months. And people say, oh, that's very hard. What is so hard with that? If you throw in the net, <coughs> It takes you 45 minutes. People are out there working eight to 10 hours a day, and then we can't throw for 45 minutes. <laughs> why? And even though if you're going to school, why can't you throw 45 minutes in the morning and 45 thro throws in the afternoon? Why? why, why? I, I, I don't understand. When I was throwing myself, I was throwing in California with all those elections, and we threw 11 times a week, up to like, 15 to 20,000 throws a year. I'm not saying that you need to do that because we are actually smarter today. We are, thro we are throwing less and we are training less, but we are training <coughs> more smart. And what I use in my theories is science. What's going on in modern way of lifting and throwing and this kind of stuff. I try to keep up with that. I use my experience with training with Wolfgang Smith, Mark Wilkins, John Powell, Art Burns, Knut Yeltnes. I've actually kept very good contact with those guys through the years and some other guys that are my aides that I used to train with. And then I, I use common sense. And common sense is social life and psychology. We actually have fun. We are healthy. We, are, we try to have, like, be good representatives for the sport. You know? Get Cantor is a superstar in this country. I've never written so many autographs myself as when I came there now a couple of weeks ago. It was just unbelievable. You no, know, like uh, after the season, we were invited over there. And, and like, I mean, he's a star, but like, I've, I almost felt like, oh, 47 <laughs> year old Icelandic guy hadn't written an autograph for 15 years. And, and suddenly, like, people were in a line. It's, it's fun. So we, we have a message to young people. Throw the discus, have fun with it, and do it in a systematic way, and be good representative for the sport. Look good, be clean, and, and like uh, have fun with it. But to your question, throw and throw and throw and throw, and gradually get better in the lifting. I'm going to go through the early part of Gert Kanter's training when he, in the technical part today, where we, no, tomorrow, where we do a lot of drills. Are you going to do what we did in 2000 to 2004? And then when he's going to show you what he's doing today, that's a typical training session. You're going to see how he's going to do. <coughs> Any more questions about this part? Time flies when we have fun. Do you have a break? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I go to the jugger. If he's throwing 70 meters uh, in most camps, yeah. um, 
is it, why isn't the discus moving as fast in competition? Is it nerves? Is, is it, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's really easy. If you, if you go on a camp and you throw in good conditions maybe, uh, 70 meters in January, and you can foul and there's nobody that is putting any pressure on you. You're just throwing far, screaming the hell out of it and stuff. But if it's the 25th competition during the summer, where he has been traveling all year, you know, from June or middle of May through different countries, it's actually pretty tough. So it, 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 it is very different Gerd Cantor that throws the discus far in the Olympic Games or the World Championships. That's an extremely fit guy, usually a little bit lighter than he is in San Diego in May. In May, he's throwing on brutality, on uh, motivation. We are coming from the snow. We are going to San Diego, beautiful facility. And we are just throwing, and it's fun. It's always good wind. And it's really fun, and we're just slamming the hell out. But in the Olympic Games, millions of people are watching you live on TV, no wind, big stadiums. He's been to 20 competitions. He's a lighter guy. He's a better discus thrower, and he throws as far. Okay? He's a different guy. And that is what I call peaking mentally, physically, technically, socially, tactically, everything. In May, you're just throwing. You're just throwing far good conditions, physically very strong, but not technically perfect and not physically <coughs> on the top. It's very important to understand this. Do you have a break between training camp and then going on to your... Yeah, um, good question. Gert is a, is a robot. He can train very much. I just put the push button on. <laughs> I push the button and he just goes. It's really good to be his coach. He believes in what we do, and he just does it. For the most part through the years, I have had to really push that he has to rest in September after the season. <coughs> the first time ever this year, when he won, he actually rested for three weeks and didn't do one session. And I just, yes. <laughs> he like cleaned his mind, you know? But during the Let's say now he has one week left of hypertrophy period. Then Christmas comes, and I'm actually a little bit like, a, ah, d during the years I've gotten better on this. He gets an active rest week during Christmas until New Year. Socially perfect. Enjoy yourself. Eat well. Stay with your family. It's part of the social time. One easy week before South Africa, and then we go. Okay. After South Africa, maintenance program for six to eight weeks. Usually, I have a couple of other weeks, active rest weeks, when I see the tendons in him that he needs it, mentally or physically. So usually two to three weeks during the whole year, we have a rest week. And a rest week is an active rest week. OK? Hey, during your wake-up call, yeah. He warms up like usually. We, we do a lot of warm up, and he's going to show you when we train how the warm up is. And it's actually like a 40 minute thing. It takes 40 minutes to warm up. He has his own physio that is usually with him. He's not here today, but he does his warm up with him. All kinds of exercises, coordination, um, physio, stabilization. It takes 40 minutes. Even, uh, yeah. 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 Do and then we uh, usually a little bit shorter warm up in this wake up call, but 20 to 30 minutes plus 10 throws on 90% of max. Then little stretch, then go home 24 hours later, compete. Really good stuff. Okay? More? Yeah. Um, how much emphasis on stretching do you uh, Pretty much. Uh, certain exercises that the physio does on him every day. So we do stretch and stabilization and stomach and that kind of stuff every day. 
40 minutes before practice, 20 to 30 minutes after practice. So you spend a lot of time staying healthy. <coughs> so we can train really hard during the training part, but he spends a lot of time warming up and actually much more than he used to now uh, because he has this physio that works with him full time. I'll be back.